uh, thanks for inviting me to the conference. This has been amazing, and I feel um, I feel a little unequal to the task of being the last paper, but uh, so it goes. <laughs> um, so. Uh, since its launch in 2003, um, Second Life, uh, which is a virtual environment um, in which its content has been mostly created by its in-world denizens, it's become a place for people to play, shop, and also practice their religion. Second Life, like actual life, I'm now referred about as AL, is, a compri is comprised of a mix of both secular and also sacred spaces. Uh, Linden Lab is the corporate entity that maintains the online platform, but it's mostly the denizens themselves that design and create the landscapes, the, the places, the uh, objects, the clothing, and the art that one finds in Second Life. I'm an anthropologist. Um, I did an online study for um, a few years from 2010 to 2012, and then I returned for follow-up work for several months um, in this past year. Uh, so in this article, I push back against the notion of the end of decay time, uh, which is a, a notion by Andrew Hoskins, um, who seemed to suggest that kind of in this Web 2.0 era, um, everything was immobile, permanent, archived, um, no, nothing decayed, nothing ended. Um, and so I'm going to explore what happened when sacrality of worth in and certain Buddhist virtual objects and places ceased to be. In this vein, I discuss my informant's thinking regarding digital impermanences and the ways that notions of precarity and effect can elucidate the complex feelings that virtual actors feel uh, in, in spaces that so easily change and sometimes disappear. When I first started preliminary explorations of Buddhism and Second Life in the late aughts, so really a decade ago, um, I was fascinated by the hardwood for our monastery. Uh, actually, sorry, I think um, I should note that uh, so this is the place where I did um, two years of field work um, from 2010 to 2012. Um, this was this is the Buddha Center, for, uh, which is still active today. Uh, so when I was uh, doing preliminary work, uh, I was interested in this place, um, the Hardwood Forest Monastery, um, and it had these monastics and meditators. Um, I also looked forward to studying the pilgrimage routes of the Bodhisim, uh, where an avatar can, could circumambulate the simulation of Mount Meru or do a three-point prostration in front of Kathmandu Swayamunath Stupa. I was also interested in the Potala Palace construction site in Second Life, uh, which wasn't up and running, but people were working on replicating the Potala Palace of uh, Lhasa um, so that the Dalai Lama could occupy his rightful space, if only virtually. So as I explored these sites um, in Second Life, um, I noted these and other potential spaces where people were um, basically using Second Life as a, as a space to um, express their Buddhism and to, and to do Buddhist practice. Um, however, when I re-engaged with Second Life in earnest at the outside of, outside of field work in 2010, I was surprised to learn that none of those three spaces uh, that I just, these three spaces, uh, Hartwood, uh, the Bodhisattva, and the Potala Palace, uh, none of those three places existed in Second Life any longer. Um, so in the intervening months before I started field work, they'd each run out of steam, they'd collapsed due to the unmet need for more donations. Um, so pieces of those builds may still be out there in code, um, maybe on file at Linden Lab, or maybe in builder inventories, but those places were no longer accessible to me. I couldn't visit them, I couldn't do field work at them. Um, so they become offline non-places, or no longer places. Uh, their virtuality made even more explicit by the ease with which they disappeared. Tom Bolstorff is an anthropologist that has done a lot of work in Second Life, and um, he's noted that um, you can't write as if you're representing a subculture that's fixed in time. And it's especially important for those of us working in virtual spaces uh, to uh, to kind of write in the, in the past tense, because uh, he writes, quote, all ethnography inevitably becomes history, unquote. Um, 
and Gregory Grieve, uh, who is not here and who literally wrote the book about um, Buddhism and Second Life, uh, he noted in his book, uh, quote, unlike the actual world where abandoned buildings leave ruins, in Second Life, all that remains is error code, unquote. So in order to contextualize the slew of Buddhist deletions, it is really important to note um, that there were spaces that, that persisted and thrived. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this paper in looking at deleted spaces. But it's really important to note that places like the Buddha Center, where I did my work, um, and places like um, Hogan, where Gregory Grieve did his work, those places are thriving, they have communities, they are still, they still exist 10 years later. Uh, so I don't want to kind of give you the wrong idea, I just, um, I want to talk about something a little different, which is just what it means that some of these places that, that people lovingly made are no longer. Uh, so, and, I, and I'm just arguing that there's some anthropological significance to that. In the full-length paper that I wrote, um, I discussed the three cases of the deleted Buddhist places in more detail, the Pozzola Palace Project, the Hartwood Forest Monastery, and the Bodhisattva. And, and I don't have time to go into detail about them here, except to say that the invisible, um, deleted, built, and then unbuilt non-ruins, um, as well as abandoned, non-occupied spaces, standing in virtual spaces, they demonstrate a kind of virtual femorality that's no less real than actual life precarity, although perhaps moving at a faster tempo. In actual life, precarity is increasingly the common thread of the neoliberal post war globalized moment. Um, and in this uh, section, I'm gonna argue for a double precarity for second life actors. The worlds being built in second life are entangled in the actual life instabilities that builders experience in their embodied non-virtual lives. But the virtuality of second life makes for an ease of disappearance that makes their virtual worlds and work especially precarious. The modern Buddhist too then, from the global north or south, is now bothered by a newly distinguishable patina of instability and a lack of solid ground upon which to build a stable and lasting future. Buddhist actors in Second Life must contend with precarity in their everyday lives on and offline. In terms of the three built and then unbuilt landscapes I mentioned earlier, they each have their own connections with particular actual life troubles and instabilities. For example, the Potala Palace was inspired by the builder's sadness and frustration that the Tibetan nation state was still incorporated within the boundaries of the modern Chinese state. And each of the disappeared fields, including the Bodhisattva, were affected deeply and fatally by the capitalism embraced by the for-profit corporate world of Linden Lab. So each of these user-generated builds were spurred by the desire to create something beautiful and Buddhist, uh, and they were ultimately discontinued, discontinued due to lack of funds. So how much faster, more fluid, and more precarious are our virtual landscapes? Right, the second life actor faces uh, what Anna Singh uh, called the conditions of precarity, uh, quote, life without promise of stability, unquote. And they face it in actual worlds and virtual worlds as well. So exploring the landscape of Second Life has always meant exploring what a particular place looks like at that moment. Um, so still as used to change in Second Life as I've become, I was taken aback when a place that I was familiar with and felt a connection to winked out of existence. Um, so this is... I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, so there's a place called Drupyul, which was a Buddhist space that I'm gonna discuss a little. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a personal ethnography uh, or uh, autoethnography. Um, but I would argue that um, it's important to kind of talk about our emotions and feelings. Uh, so uh, Anna, Aubrey Annabelle puts a finer point on it by writing about how digital worlds of video games are a part and parcel of contemporary ex human experiences and psychological worlds writ large. She writes, and quote, video games are affective systems, end quote. So in 2018, after neglecting Second Life for about five years to work on other things, um, so this is what things looked like when I kind of shut down my first, uh, you know, my first uh, 
set of research. I went back to the Buddha Center, um, and you can see, you can actually look at the difference, right? Look at the main um, altar, the main Buddha. Uh, this is the same place um, several years later, uh, and the, you know, the, the graphics are a little nicer, the visualization is a little nicer, but it's the same place, and a lot of the same teachers were, were teaching, etc. Um, the, the details had changed a little, but um, it did feel a little bit like returning home. And there are other, um, there are other uh, folks that have worked in digital worlds, like T.L. Taylor, um, who talk about returning to virtual spaces that they had relationships with. Uh, after several years away, and and uh, comparing it to kind of a returning home, I mean, I certainly felt that way. Uh, so, in the course of my, so I decided to kind of go a little bit on pilgrimage to the places that I'd spent a lot of time when I had done I had done work from 2010 to 2012. So, in the course of my explorations, I went to pay my respects to Drupal, that small Buddhist temple that I mentioned before, um, and I was really uh, shocked and and disappointed, and I felt very sad that it was gone. It was just not there anymore. It was. It had been removed. Um, I felt unsettled. Um, I reached out to the builder, who was one of my informants. Um, his, I'm going to call him Tornado Alchemy in this paper, um, it's a pseudonym. Um, but I wanted to find out whether he had moved it or renamed it. Um, and he said, actually, um, it, it was gone. He said, in, in actual life, in 2012, he parted ways with the Bhutanese teacher um, whom it was built to honor, and therefore he had soon just dis dismantled the lakang without ceremony, in his words. He told me one of the large prayer wheels was relocated, and then he subsequently built another temple in this space, um, and then it stayed there for three years, and then that was moved to. So uh, by, by talking with him, and in the paper, there's a, a larger discussion of kind of exactly what happened in this case, but you can see how, you know, the, um, the attachments that he had to particular things uh, changed over time uh, with his, uh, with changing situations of his actual life. Um, but, you know, he built these, he built these spaces with quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of, of a sense that he was developing good karma, that it was a part of his Buddhist practice, um, that he was being a good Buddhist, making merits, and creating a space both where he could meditate and others could meditate. Um, I, ha um, I know that he had uh, services there from time to time. So for example, a friend of his had a, a family member that died and they had a service inside this temple. You know, their avatars came and they did a, a ritual service. Um, so this is this is a no longer place, uh, and so I was uh, very interested when he told me that the prayer wheels uh, that he had made, um, he had had moved one of them. And I, when I was studying with with um, when I was studying in 2011, um, Tornado Alchemy kind of unmade in front of me one of these prayer wheels to show me how he had made it, and it was this really interesting moment. Um, so you can see here what one of these looks like together, and then he had another one sitting right next to it, and he pulled it into pieces for me so that I could see what was going on. Um, so he, he took it apart, and he showed me, um, furthermore, if you can see even closer, how he had pasted a mantra texture in Tibetan script onto the internal layer of the wheel, so that it was even more similar to kind of what was actually happening in a real wheel. And he, um, you know, in our interview talked about how when people would touch the, when avatars would touch the wheel, it would spin. And he cared a lot about the, the tempo with which it would spin. And so he, he made sure that the um, animation was spinning at the right speed so that it looked like an actual Tibetan wheel. So, uh, when when I found out from him that he had moved it, uh, I, I went to the place, I went searching for it, um, because I, I felt a connection to this holy object and its story. Um, so I found the giant prayer wheel in its new home in the Kwanian Terraces. Um, so 
uh, he had us, you know, situated it kind of next to um, a waterfall and next to a cherry tree, and um, he had a, a basically said that he ha he had um, a feeling that it, it was important to preserve. So even though he had taken a break, the law come, um, it was important for him to maintain the fair wheel. Um, so in this paper, um, including Drupal, I've noted four Buddha spaces, each lovingly crafted, and each in their turn, wholly wiped off the face of the second life landscape. It's tempting to compare these spaces to a Tibetan sun mandala or a Japanese Zen sand garden, spaces which are meant to be in permanence and are thus intended to remind the practitioner of the truth of impermanence. But it's worth noting that these spaces were not built in that spirit. These builds were not supposed to be summarily unbuilt. They were built or, or worked upon to be used, explored, appreciated. Um, they were supposed to last longer than they did. The, the deletions were a direct response to a kind of failure of these spaces. Um, the Buddhist notion of emptiness in Buddhist discourse, of course, um, as you all know, means that there's nothing essential about anything. Everything is in process and in flux. Um, the notion of impermanence is key to emptiness since everything changes fluidly from moment to moment. Since impermanence is a key theme in Buddhist philosophy, it's not surprising that Buddhists in Second Life have engaged with the notion of emptiness in their discourses about Second Life. Um, and in my paper, I talk a little bit, uh, I'm gonna just quote from Gregory Greaves' paper, uh, his book, sorry. Um, he writes, uh, for convert Buddhists, Second Life and real life were different but the same, and Second Life's empty nature illuminated the illusory quality of real life. Second Life and real life were obviously different because one was actual and the other virtual. They were similar, however, because both second life and real life were conditioned conventional realities, those mutually constituted in historical, historically contextualized material discourses, practice, and objects by which people construct, interpret, and manage their everyday lives." Unquote. Yet his informants did not read the emptiness of all things as a reason to disrupt and disrespect the created Buddhist environments that they built for the community. Um, their organizers built these spaces carefully, they treated them with respect, um, and in his book um, he talks about how the particular landscape of the Japanese um, um, community that he was working with, uh, they, uh, they built this very carefully, they had a very kind of romanticized um, pre-modern Asian landscape, um, and he, and, and I'll quote, um, visual elements dominated, buildings, mountains, forests, end quote. Uh, they had, a, they had a, 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 a garden, right? They had a Zen garden uh, on the grounds of this uh, mountain retreat. But the community itself shouldn't be perceived as some sort of digital Zen garden. Um, it's not itself supposed to be a sandbox that's changing in order to be uh, in order to show uh, impermanence. It's a space that res residents occupy and use, and like most communities in actual life, its denizens would be unhappy to see it disappear. Uh, religious studies Daniel Bedlinger has argued that the medium of the internet lends itself to Buddhist thinking. Um, he wrote, quote, the more time one spends on the internet, the more likely one is to have a an affinity for Buddhism, end quote. While I'm not convinced that the internet is creating more Buddhistically inclined people, I do see that online sociality may connect nicely with some Buddhist ideas and may reinforce those notions for Buddhists online. Uh, Bedlinger uh, notes, quote, the internet affords a conception of the individual self as illusory, replacing an unchanging self with a sense of interconnectedness and interdependence, and these ideas dovetail nicely with Buddhist notions of anatman, no self, and pratitya samuppada dependent origination, and are likely to play an important role in the attractiveness of Buddhism to the wired segments of society." End quote. For Buddhists who choose to reflect upon the synergies between Buddhist ideas and experience of, virt of virtual being and virtual, virtual spaces, there are opportunities to use the double precarity of virtuality to think with. So while the no longer spaces of Buddhist second life that I've explored in this paper were not built to be ritually dismantled, 
In retrospect, their losses have been interpreted thusly by several of my Buddhist informants in Second Life, interpreted as examples of uh, impermanence in action. Does that mean I have two more minutes? Um, time is up. Okay, that was really quick. Take 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds, okay. I'll just um, throw up here uh, an, an interview that I did uh, where uh, one of my informants did use this uh, this uh, this uh, discourse of impermanence to, to talk about uh, the fact that second life can be seen as kind of a mandala, right? So it can it can function to provide spaces for people to think through Buddhist philosophy. Um, I think that my that I I want to say that 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 is true and important and a part of the anthropology of second life, but that it's also important to note that these places are like communities in actual life that people have attachments to, right? And are and feelings and emotions of um, of sadness when they disappear. And that's also a part of the anthropology of Buddhism and Second Life that we need to pay attention to. So thank you.